the book of Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, I'm going to go to the very last verse of the book of Revelation, the last verse of the New Testament scriptures, the last verse of the entire collection of the scriptures that we have. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for us as a people of God. And so it's not by any measure of, of accident or, or just by sheer nature of organization, but it's by God's design that we see things ordered the way that we see them ordered. And God closes out the Word of God, as we see in Revelation 22, verses 21, with this particular verse. He says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The primary thought of that verse is, is the prayer of grace to be with us all. And so, Lord willing, we're going to look at, at God's grace this morning as we, um, as we try to study God's Word some. I heard the song saying this week, I was singing in my car with it, Amazing Grace. We stop and think about that song and the, the author and the conditions that he was in whenever he wrote the song. And, and just in our lifetime, we can sing that song and think about God's grace in our life and why that, that, the words of that song can be so rich in our hearts and understanding of who God is, how it can truly be an act of worship of God by singing Amazing Grace. And if we could just take a few moments this morning and consider what all really truly is amazing about God's grace. Some of the thoughts we're going to have, we're going to pick from the low-hanging fruit, and I trust that you'll go home and you'll begin to dig in God's Word and you'll find that higher fruit that's there when we look, consider the grace of God and what it means to us and what it does for us and, and why God pours it out in our lives at times. Because the, the higher up you go in this tree of grace, the bigger and the more juicy and the greater the truth claims become of what God's grace really is for us. The author here, God, writing in the closing of the New Testament, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now there's, there's two verses. I don't know if the, line, my, the Lord will leave it on my mind tonight to look at the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we're going to look this morning, just we're willing, at the idea of grace. And I want to start with I don't know, one that's more simple, I believe. So if you'll back up with me to the book of, of Matthew, chapter 20. But this is the grace of God in our life in all of these verses. What is grace? Just a just a while you're turning there to consider this for just a moment. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It's the favor and the blessing and the the um, the love and and the pouring out of God in our life. I remember many years ago, Brother Billy was teaching on grace and mercy on a Wednesday night, and God asked that, "What's the definition? What's the difference between grace and mercy?" And Sister Cheryl spoke up, and and she gave that <laughs> definition: Grace is God giving us something when we don't deserve it. That's just a beautiful thought in that definition alone. God, I don't deserve it, yet God gives. In His abounding grace, in his, the depth of His grace, He pours out and He gives and He gives and He gives because God is full of grace. It gives a, de a description of Jesus in John chapter 1 as it's talking about who Jesus is. And it says Jesus is full, not just partially there, not three quarters of the way, but full, running over, full of grace and truth. As we think about the, the grace that's been given and poured out in our life because of who Jesus Christ is, I'm thankful that Jesus is full of grace. And the well of grace that He has and He is, it never dries up. It's always there for us. But the first aspect of grace that I want to look at is, is one that kind of is a beginning point for us. Matthew chapter 20 here. Let's look in beginning in verse 30. Where the glory of God reads, and behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. Now, I like how it works, because they should hold their peace. There's nothing about these two blind men sitting by the wayside that's in the, in the a cultural context, context necessarily that is of any significance about them. They're just two blind men sitting on the wayside. That's how it, how it get, kind of describes them there. But they begin to cry out, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And because of their crying out after Jesus to have mercy on them, the people, the multitude, are saying, Hold your peace. And then it goes on in verse 31, it says, But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, Have 
What will ye that I shall do unto you? Now they're crying out for mercy. I know we're not seeing the word grace here, but I'm going to make this applicable to every one of us in this room in just a moment. We're not physically blind, but there is a spiritual blindness on our part. And but by the grace of God, we would still be spiritually blind, just as these two men here are naturally blind. And they've not done anything to deserve God's favor to be placed on them, as we're going to see Jesus do here in just a moment in this passage. Yet they're sitting by the wayside, nothing more than just mere two blind men there. They should be holding their peace. They shouldn't be crying out. Yet they cry out, Jesus, have mercy on us. And that is exactly like you and I as a people of God here this morning. There is nothing in us that gives us any right to cry out to Jesus, say, Jesus, open my eyes that I might see. Every time we sit down and we take the Word of God and we open it up and we begin to read the inspired Word of God, there is no right that we have to demand of Jesus Christ to reveal what that Scripture is really teaching us. It is the grace of God. It is His good pleasure. It is His goodness toward us that whenever we sit down with the inspired Word and we read a passage like what we're reading here this morning, that God opens our understanding. He opens our eyes that we might see and not just see words, not just see sentences. We might see Jesus Christ in those words that we're reading. That is the goodness of God toward us. That is His grace with us. That He would open our eyes just as He opens the eyes of these two blind men here. Let me finish reading the passage now. Verse 33. They say unto Him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them. He had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. I, I just I, I love that passage whenever I was considering grace this week and praying through that. There's truly nothing in me that deserves to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. To even call myself a Christian. And so why am I able to call myself a Christian? Why do I see Jesus Christ at times and desire to follow him? Out of God's grace, He opened my eyes. He's opened your eyes. And by His grace, He gives us insight and He gives us wisdom that we might see Jesus through the pages of Scripture. That we might see God answer prayers and how He works through prayers. Brother Billy is strengthened. I went and saw him yesterday and to be able to sit with him and see the joy on his face and see what strength is there in him and to see him talk and share and rejoice as he's watched God do so many different things. We may say, brethren, that the medical doctors in that hospital was just absolutely wonderful in how they treated him. And they finally figured out how to get his medications and his procedures just right. But that's not truth. It's God working through those doctors and medications to bring him the health that he needs. And it is God's grace in our life to open our eyes that we might see God has heard your prayers. God has answered your prayers. God has lifted him up to allow us to see a miracle. God has done these things, not because we deserve an ounce of it, but in God's grace, he shows you as the God of the Old Testament, as the God of the days of the early church, he is still the God of the day, hearing prayers and being with his people and hearing their prayers and giving answers to their prayers that we might know and proclaim not just a miracle has occurred but there is a Lord on his throne who reigns over us today that we might see Jesus Christ plainly in a situation like we see with Brother Billy. Mm -hmm. It is God's grace that opens our eyes and if it wasn't for that grace we would be spiritually blind and we would think that it was medication that was the answer for everything. Or we would think that we had to have just the right doctor to be able to minister to every physical need that we had. Or we would think we had to be in just the perfect church to have any measure of some kind of morality in our life. There's a moral bone in everybody here. But the reason that moral bone is in your body is because it's God's grace that has blessed you to have it. And it's God's grace that's opened our eyes that we might see how God's at work. Let's go to a different one. Back up to the Old Testament. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. You probably recognize this particular chapter. Just calling it out. What all happens in this chapter. God, as the sovereign God that He is, has created in chapters 1 and chapter 2. And He 
He creates, he speaks to the word, and things just kind of come into fruition. They come to happen. They're, there they are. God creates man in his image. He gives him dominion and responsibility within the garden, sets him up in the garden. Great blessing. There's communion and fellowship with God while Adam walks in the cool of the garden. And then here in chapter 3, we see the serpent enter into the picture. Let's start in verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, beginning of verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God, no, God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, if we just back up just for just a second, why is it that we know the difference between good and evil? Because God's grace has opened our eyes to it. It's not by some fruit that we've tasted of a natural element in this world. Satan's bringing in this idea to, um, to Eve here that if you just eat that fruit, the forbidden fruit, then you'll know good and evil. But the reality is, God says, keep my commandments and then you'll live. God's opened our eyes to understand that if we follow Jesus Christ, we'll live. But if we do it our own way, or we buy into the lies of Satan, there's going to be death. And with death comes separation. That's the spiritual death that we see here in this passage of Scripture. We see, I'm going to skip down now, Eve looks at the tree and she sees that it is good looking and it looks delicious and so she eats and she gives to Adam and he eats and sin, the fall of mankind now um, occurs here in chapter 3 and their sin, and they try to hide, they're ashamed, they're ashamed of their nakedness, they're ashamed of their, um, their condition now as a people of God and they have rebelled greatly against God. One standard that God raised up, you shall not eat of the tree of the fruit that's in the midst of the garden because in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. They deserve, Adam and Eve deserves eternal hell. And we all, because of that sin, deserve it as well. But I'm after the grace of God in this passage of Scripture. Go all the way down to chapter, to verse 14, rather, rather, in this chapter. Verse 14, the Word of God says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, we're talking about the, the serpent here, but don't miss the grace of God in this passage we're about to look at. The serpent slithered into the garden, deceived Eve. Adam sinned by taking the fruit that Eve gave him. They've rebelled against God. They deserve no mercy and no grace because of their rebellion against God. And this is the first act of grace that we see now after sin enters the picture. We just read verse 14, which describes the curse that God places on the serpent. But listen to the grace in verse 15. And I will put, this is God, God saying, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Do you hear what's just happened there? God's saying, in the midst of your rebellion, and in the midst of this place that you can now know, you cannot deliver yourself from, you will die, because God's promise, His word to them is true. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Death entered in that day, and Adam and Eve could not deliver themselves from that condition of death. And God comes along and says to Satan, okay, this is the curse of you, but let me tell you what's going to happen. You'll bruise his heel. You'll bruise your head. That's Jesus Christ right there. God's grace is so abundant and so abounding. It's so good and it's so that from the very beginning, with sin entering the picture, God places grace there. And it doesn't just stop there. There's provision even in the midst of that sin that Adam and Eve has. There's a promise, the grace of God in our lives, that we can hang ourselves on the promises of God that Jesus was going to come from Genesis here. Jesus was going to come and he was going to, he was going to be victorious in all things. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. 
We are victorious because of Jesus Christ, because he has conquered the devil. He has overcome the grave. There is no death for the people of God, not because we did anything to deserve it or because we earned it, but by the grace of God, he sent his only begotten son into this world. He became a man for us. That's the grace of God. That in all points that we're struggling, he understands our struggles as well. That's the grace of God in our life. He suffered greatly with the beatings and the scourgings and the mockings and the, and the crown of thorns and the hanging on the cross. And by every stripe that he took upon his own shoulders, it's a demonstration of his grace for the healing of us that death would not hold us back, but that we'd have life in Jesus Christ. What's amazing about the grace of God? that God was seen His only begotten Son into this world, that we might have life today and for all of eternity. And that even yet in that place of sin, go on down with me. Get on to verse 21. And of Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. I didn't read all this chapter, but when, when they sinned, they hid themselves. They were naked and they were ashamed of their nakedness. They were ashamed of the condition. And that nakedness is a, is, there's a good sermon to be preached out of that as well. That nakedness is a description of their vulnerability as the people of God without the blessing of God in their life. Without the relationship and fellowship with God. And God takes their nakedness now. And he creates clothes. They tried to clothe themselves. It's a futile attempt as a human nature to try to cover up our shame with meager, meager clothes like some leaves. But God takes them, and in his grace and his goodness, he provides for them. He gives them clothes, as it says there in verse 21. He clothed them. He covered them. I'm not going to turn to the verse at the moment, but if we go over to the prophets and we see some of the things that God says about the clothing that he puts on us, that he's given to us. Here's my favorite one. God, because of his grace, has clothed us with the garments of salvation. What a beautiful thing. We don't deserve it. God's grace is an absolute amazing thing in our life. That we rebel against God. Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And the first thing God does is say, okay, I've got my son coming, and he's going to be victorious. That's written for our understanding. That grace is there for us to have the promise of God there, to hang our faith on. And he says, I'm going to clothe. I, he clothed Adam and Eve in the midst of their rebellion. We read in our Bible study class this morning, Jacob, where he says, I'm not worthy of the least of these thy mercies. And it's true for all of us. We're not worthy of any of the mercies of God in our life. We're not worthy of the grace that he gives but that's what's so amazing about his grace. He closes out in Proverb, I mean Revelation rather, may the grace of the Lord. We consider what he's saying there. It's not just, just um, comfort or maybe a little bit of favor. When you begin to consider what the grace of the Lord is and how great this grace is, how amazing his grace is, and it's unmerited. It's unmerited. It's because of who God is and his goodness to us. That's an amazing, an amazing truth in God's Word. That He would open our eyes to see it. And as we begin to see Jesus Christ, we see from the very beginning there was a perfect plan in place. And even in the midst of the plan and the chaos of sin now, there's provision in Him clothing us and taking care of us. It's amazing grace. Go with me over to uh, Genesis chapter 20. Here in this passage of Scripture, we're going to see an Egyptian king that God's grace is at work in, but it's for our understanding that we might understand how God's grace works and why it's so amazing. Genesis chapter 20, I'm going to begin in verse 1. And we see here Abraham and the Egyptian Abimelech, I think is how you say his name. Verse 1 says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, think about that for just a moment. Abimelech doesn't know. He was lied to. He believed the lie. 
And so he's acting in their customs of that day. God comes to him in a dream and says, you're but a dead man. All right? That's a pretty fearful thought to have. Amen. Wake up from that dream for a second and think about it, what God just said. Now listen to what he says. But Abimelech, in verse 4, had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands have I done this. Now I can't, you can't separate what Abimelech just said there with the next verse. In the integrity of Abimelech's heart and the innocency, innocency, I can't say that word, of his hands. He was innocent. Verse 6, And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thine heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. The grace of God demonstrated through Abimelech there is that he withheld Abimelech from, from sinning. Now we see it here in this passage of Scripture, brethren, because God has written it out for us. But I want to boldly say to each one of us in this room, there are moments and days where we have no clue that God has in His grace withheld you from sinning against Him. And that is the abounding grace. We don't even know what we're doing. We're walking in darkness at the moment or we're walking ignorantly to something. But if we're walking with, in integrity as believers in Jesus Christ, if we're trying to be faithful to God, it's the goodness of God and His grace that He pours out into our life to restrain us from doing something that our, in our flesh we intend to do. Or in our flesh we arrogantly go about doing. Isn't that an amazing thing as well? God's grace to restrain Abimelech, someone who's not even a part of the nation of Israel there, but God's grace in restraining him. His grace is amazing. God's grace in restraining you from making a mistake and going into a sin that you're ignorantly headed into, but God's love for you and his grace towards you is amazing in that he would restrain. I withheld, God says to Abimelech, I also withheld thee from sinning against me. God loves us that he would withhold us in his grace from sinning against him. Now let's go to one other story here in Genesis and look at the grace of God. Let's go to Joseph. So Genesis chapter 50. Great story. Joseph is a picture and a type of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The brethren who sinned against him and who did what was right in their own eyes is a picture and a type of you and I as a people of God. And just a quick story, if you don't remember Joseph, he had 11 brothers, 10 brothers at that time. They um, sold him into slavery. He went to Potiphar's house as a slave. Um, he was lied against, and so he was thrown into jail. Um, he stayed in jail for a number of years, and the people who helped didn't remember him at first, to where eventually, by interpreting the Pharaoh's dream, he became second in command in all of Egypt. And you think about Joseph's life, there was great suffering, there was great struggle, there was great um, rejection, there was great deception placed on him. All of these things parallels kind of the story of Jesus, yet Joseph was a man who retained his integrity. He was a man who did what was pleasing to God. He knew his place with God, and so he, he didn't take those adversities and those problems that he was in when he was in the the hole in the ground and he was a slave in Potiphar's house or in the jail, he faithfully served God at all times. And then we know how God brings a great famine in the nation of Israel and the brothers who had, are the ones who sold him into slavery have to stand before Joseph and they have to ask for food or they're going to die. When we come to this particular scene in Genesis chapter 50, I'm going to read verses 15 down through 21. Verse 15 says, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us of all the evil which we did unto him. They're remembering now all that evil that they have done to him, and they recognize we don't deserve any grace whatsoever. It's now come reckoning time. That's what they believe in their mind. It's now come reckoning time. Verse 16, And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command thee before he died, saying, so shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sins, for they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God, 
of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and he spake kindly unto them. That story of Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ to you and I as a people today. Our Lord, we don't deserve. We've done evil against the Lord in the days of our life. There's reason for us to experience the reckoning of God that we might be accountable for the ways that we've treated Jesus as a people of God. But God's grace is so amazing that there he stands. As Joseph said there, I stand in the place of God. Jesus stands in the place of God. And instead of the wrath that we deserve, and we can, again, get into another sermon on the wrath of God, but instead of getting into the wrath of God that we do deserve because of our self-righteousness, there's provision yet again. They didn't starve to death. God had placed Joseph at the right place and the right time for the right purposes to serve and to save alive many people that included those brothers that sold him into slavery and his own dad. And so there was bread and there was land and there was work for the nation of Israel to do as they first came into um, that land there of Goshen because Joseph was able to provide for them just as God provides for us. And not only that, the blessing of the amazing grace of God in forgiving those brothers. I, I can tell you right now, I'm not, I'm, not that, I'm not good enough to be able to think about forgiving to that degree. But God is. Jesus is. His grace is abounding in forgiveness over us. But not just provision, not just forgiveness. He delivered them. And I think the biggest thing that I like here in this passage of Scripture is where Joseph says there, I'm in the place of God. You thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. God's grace is demonstrated to us in this passage of Scripture through His sovereignty. We don't see how the next leg of the story is going to come to pass yet. I don't know how all things are going to fit together in my life with the things that I'm concerned about and I'm worried about. But because God has opened my eyes through His grace... God has allowed me to see it. He provides. I can trust that God is sovereign. His grace is to show us that He's a sovereign God over us. And that He's not taken by surprise by anything that we deal with. He wasn't taken by surprise by what those brethren did to Joseph. And because He wasn't taken by surprise, He had a perfect plan. And He worked out that perfect plan to save much people alive. Just as He did with Esther. Just as He did with all the way through Scripture to the glorious point of Jesus Christ saving you and I alive spiritually for all of eternity. It's the grace of God. But I want you to think about this for just a moment, brethren. Is God's grace amazing? And I say this not with intent to we do things out of guilt or out of obligation, but because of how amazing His grace is. We need to stop regularly and just thank God for His grace. Thank God for the goodness that He pours out into our life through the form of grace. I don't believe that we stop and thank God enough. We ignorantly go about doing things and He restrains us. God, thank you today for the way that you've restrained me from sinning against you. I don't know what it is, but I know you're there. And by His grace, He's restrained. God, thank You that You've opened up my eyes that I can even see Jesus Christ. Thank You for that amazing grace that You've given in my life. Let's turn to Luke chapter 23. I'll go through two more verses. Luke chapter 23. Let's begin reading in verse 39 of chapter 23. At this scene, Jesus is hanging on the cross. And there are two thieves hanging on either side of Him at this point. Verse 39, it says, And one of the malefactors who were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, that's the other malefactor, the other thief that's hanging on the other side, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, 
For we receive the due reward of our deeds. What he's saying there is we deserve this crucifixion that we're on. We deserve the punishment that we're experiencing at the moment. But this man, that's Jesus, hath done nothing amiss. Now these next few verses is what I'm after. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou enter into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The dude's hanging on the cross. He's about to die. And he's lived his life riotously. He deserves the judgment that he's getting. He deserves the consequence of hanging on that cross. But God's grace is never too late. There it is with this male factor who, who has that confession, who says, this man has done nothing amidst Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And Jesus' response, in an abounding grace, the man has not done anything to deserve it, yet Jesus says, today, today, son, you'll be with me in paradise. The grace of God that's never too late in our life. There's been times where we feel like giving up in situations. Fine, I'm done, I deserve it. I'm you know, good at self-condemnation or whatever. And God's grace comes in at the twelfth hour or whatever the old saying is. It comes at the last minute, but it's never too late. It's perfectly timed. So we think it's too late in our own thinking. But we don't think about grace the way we ought to think about grace. It's God's grace, not our grace. It's God giving that grace, not us asking and therefore we receive just because we've asked. And so every time, every moment that God gives that grace to you, it's perfectly timed. And it's never too late. And it's good toward us. And let me give you one more in, in connection with it. Go back over to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Just to close it out. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're looking at a fundamental truth here in God's word. But we'll bring it together in a second. Chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's the grace of God in causing us to be born again. And then go all the way down now to um, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And so what I, how I wanted to close out this thought this morning about how amazing grace is. Now, that is talking about the eternal salvation that we have that came through Jesus Christ. But the um, grace that we see here in scriptures... The word that it puts to it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 there, it is the gift of God. Never too late. Always purposeful. But it comes from God. And it's His great gift to us. My prayer is that we would think about the amazing grace of God in the days ahead. And that we would give thanks for the amazing grace of God in the days ahead. And if, with permission, you'll allow me to say, my prayer is that the grace of God would be with you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When we walk with